What were you hunting down in Mexico? We were hunting uh, ducks and uh, and calling uh, uh, predators coyotes, you know. So okay. it's, a, it's a duck hunt, but I know these guys real well, and they let me go call coyotes, and coyotes never been called down there before, so it makes you look like you know what you're doing. That, that always helps. Well, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Save for the Blind podcast. My name is Carson, and I am the hunt program coordinator here with CWA. At the table across from me, we have Scott Mueller, who's going to be our co-host today. And on this podcast, we have Terry, the owner of Mojo Decoys and Mojo Outdoors. So welcome. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. So, Terry, I'm just going to start off. How I've, I've heard rumors from multiple people about how this whole thing, Mojo, started, the spinning wing decoy started. I heard... Um, you know, it, it originated in California. You guys bought a patent. Can, can you set the record straight on, on how everything began? Uh, I can, and I will. Uh, you know, it, it always kind of surprises me that that's one of the most frequent questions we get asked. You know, why exactly people are going to know that? I don't know, but it seems to be of great interest. So it's a, you know, it's a story that takes five or ten minutes to tell. If you want yeah, to know no, please, tell please. We're, here to, we're here to tell stories. Okay. Uh, uh, in... in the spinning wing uh, concept did, in fact, originate from California in, in about the mid nineties. I don't know exactly what year, but uh, maybe nobody knows what year. But you know, somehow they caught on to that concept out there. I've heard several stories about that, but you know, they're, they're just rumored. One of them was that they were using big fans to dry strawberries, and they noticed a mallard, the resident mallard there, would work the fans. And, <laughs> you know, I've heard, I've heard some other stories, but nevertheless, it did come out of California, and and maybe the in the in, in the mid nineties it were, and then in the year nineteen ninety nine, during the duck season in December, during the duck season, uh, uh, one one of these devices found its way in the market down to the lower Mississippi uh, Valley, more. Lower Mississippi Flyway. And there was a guy named Robert Matthews. Uh, he was a farmer. Uh, he was up in the valley, and I think he had a partner, but I'm not real clear on that. By the time I dealt with him, he did not have. But he developed this uh, uh, decoy that he called the Fatal Deduction. And uh, and a guy from California uh, came and hunted with a, uh, with a man y'all may know, uh, Jeff Simmons, Jeff from Simmons Sporting Goods. Uh, up in Bastrop, Louisiana, uh, which is about 30 miles north of, uh, of of our home, which is in Monroe, Louisiana, but it's a gigantic uh, sporting goods store. But a guy came from California to hunt with him for some reason or other, I don't know what, and he brought one of these. And Jeff, uh, you know, Jeff didn't believe in it. You know, when the, when the concept was first introduced, it wasn't necessarily intuitive. You didn't look at it and say, yeah, this thing will call it up. You know, uh, and so he wouldn't let the guy put it out. And then, as Jeff tells the story, on the third morning, I guess there was on three day, uh, on the third morning, he let the guy put it out. It just sucked the mallards in it. So now, now Jeff's uh, instantly a, a believer in this. Uh, so he tries to buy some so he could sell them to it in his sporting goods store because he started telling his customers about it, and they all wanted one, but he, he couldn't buy them. You know, the way that that, that came about, you know, the demand uh, quickly overtook the supply, you know, with uh, Mr. Matthews and whoever else might have been in that uh, with him. So Jeff calls uh, really the main player in Mojo, uh, who is my old friend of mine. He and I grew up, and uh, his name is Murray Crow. And uh, Murray uh, came out of a big, big farming family, farming big land, you know, and he was around a lot of equipment and things like that. But he really loved race cars and doing things like that. So really, that's what he was doing. His father and his brother had died. He got out of farmer, moved to Monroe, kicking around with cord, but he built anything. So Jeff calls Murray and asks Murray, can he build him some of these depots? And Murray says, yeah, I'll do that for you. So he sends one of these fatal inductions over there. Uh, Murray gets to looking at it. And the way they built the very first ones, they took a high-speed motor, a little small high-speed gear motor, kind of like what runs an old VCR, you know, remote control car or something like that. And and in order to slow it down, they had to put a pair of pulleys on it with a little drive belt. The drive belt was an O-ring, you know, and the thing worked, except that, uh, you know, it was noisy and the little drive system, you know, wouldn't sustain the uh, the winds or wouldn't sustain getting wet or stuff like that. Well, Murray didn't know how to size the pulleys. So he calls me, and I've been in the engineering business my whole life. I own a couple of engineering firms, and he called me just looking for help 
sizing these pulleys, and he starts telling me about this decoy. And I guess I'm about like Jeff was back then. I, I, was, I was intrigued by it, so I just kept asking him over and over again. I said, what kind of decoy is this for? He's talking about white on one side, dark on the other side. And he didn't know. He don't like duck hunting. He's an avid hunter, a great white tail hunter, but he don't like duck hunting. And, uh, and finally, he said, I don't know. He said, can you size the pulleys or not? I said, yeah, that's, that's nothing to do it. I'll come up to your shop at noon tomorrow. So noon the next day, I go to his shop. We get to looking at this thing. And, um, and uh, you know, first conclusion we come to, that's not a very good way of building this product. So <laughs> Murray says at the moment, he says, I think I know how to do it. Just go back to your office, go back tomorrow. So, okay. I go back to my office, I come back tomorrow. Well, he he had developed in one night, you know, what came known in the industry uh, uh, at, thereafter was the direct drive system. And having been around all that machinery, I was there was a reason I brought up the fact that in the farm, if you've been around the big epic machinery, uh, all, all, all that stuff up until maybe 10 or 15 years ago was uh, 24 volt. And uh, he had some uh, 24 volt uh, uh, roller motors, like runs a fan up in the cab of one of those pieces of what with double shaft that you have coming out of each end. So, you know, it was pretty simple. He just hooked the wings directly to the motor shaft. But in DC motors, as most of the people that's listening to us would probably know this, on DC motors, you know, is totally opposed to AC motors, which would be what you'd plug into your wall around your house. And DC motors, the speed turns proportional to the voltage that's applied to it. And so he took a six volt landing battery, hooked it to the 24 volt motor, and that cut the speed down to 25%. Of the old metal motors typically turn 2,800, 3,000, 200 RPM. So when you cut that in fourth, it's 750 RPM thereabouts. And so you got it at the right speed without having any of these pulleys, belts, gears, anything like that. Uh, and then uh, he, he liked to build and race uh, dirt track race cars, ballast people, race a engine, do a thing like that. And he had a bunch of sheets of uh, aluminum, four bay sheets of aluminum, which is what they wrapped those cars with back in those days. They still do it, I don't know. And uh, so he took those uh, aluminum sheets, which is just what he happened to have on hand, and cut the wings out of those. And that's where the aluminum wings come from. I don't. I never heard him say anything that uh, that indicated that he thought uh, the aluminum was better for it. As it turns out, it is because the more dips that it is, the more reflective it, that it is. You know, so the aluminum waves were more reflective than the plastic waves that they were using on the other ones. And he got on his way and you know cut out some uh, you know cut out some uh, wing shafts that would connect the wings directly to the motor. You know, take some decoys, cut the back out of them, stick that in there, get a six bolt landing pattern, look to it, and you had it from a durability point of view or an effective point of view, you got perfect spinning wing decoy. And the meanwhile, while he was doing that, you know, Robert Matthews had filed for a patent uh, on his device. But in that patent, he had the concept of it too, and then he had the little mechanism they had in it with the with the wings. But uh, you know, about, you know, back to Murray, uh, he recruited some of his other buddies at race cars and all that shops, stuff like that, to help you build those. And however many they could make each day, they would take the summer sporting goods at the end of the day. The people would come pick it up, pick them up right then. So nobody ever owned one for more than a day up until the final user got it. And so uh, uh, that, I got one. They let me have one. That was all. And so I had that one, and uh, I didn't believe in it. I didn't believe in it either. And, uh, but I can't remember the details of this, but, uh, 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 me and another engineer, as soon as I got that one, went hunting down at a farm that I have at Kelly Parish, great duck place, uh, like on a weekday, I do believe it was Wednesday. I don't know if we went down there to just try this thing out or we were going in the way we just took it with us, but nobody was hunting anywhere around. And my duck field on our farm, probably two miles back from the nearest public road. So we go back to this, my favorite fly. And uh, I put this thing out, and uh, and I will always remember this. Even though I'm two miles from the road, nobody can be looking at me. I look around on my shoulder to make sure nobody watches me. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how foolish I felt at the moment. <clears throat> and so I put it out. I turn it on. I start slowly wading back to my blind because it's not shooting time yet. I just no, no hurry up. And I hear. It. I turn around. I bet thirty or forty miles laying around on top of this thing. So I said, "Wait a minute." Must be something to this, you know. And uh, uh, and so it sold, it sold me. Most anybody that took one out 
and, and not in that and, and, and a few, for a few years thereafter. You know, it didn't take but a few minutes to uh, prove uh, how effective how effective it was. So, uh, uh, so Murray went on making those every day up until the end of season. And when the end of season uh, came, there was no, no further demand. Uh, you know, Jeff Summers didn't need any more, so he quit that and went back to doing fiddling with cars and doing things like that. But I could see the great potential in that. And so I kept telling him, Murray, I said, Murray, you want to go with making those things. You're good at that kind of stuff, you know. And he wasn't doing a whole lot with him cars anyway. And he said, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And so next time I'd see him, uh, I'd say the same thing. And the next time I'd say the same thing. So I kind of figured out along the way that he didn't, he don't like the business part of business. You know, he's a, he's a typical inventor, you know, tinkerer, a perfectionist, you know, so. The business part of business doesn't agree with him. So so I say one day, I said, Mark, if you want to go in that business, I'll go in it with you. And he said, I'll do that. And I said, okay, I can, you know, I set up a business. I take care of the finances, do, you know, do all that stuff. I was already in a couple of engineering businesses, a lot well to do that. And uh, uh, I said, well, you know, you can build them. Uh, uh, you know, I can set the business up and run it. Somebody's got to sell it. And that's not me and you. We're not salesmen by any means, you know. So we eventually went to, back to this guy, Jeff Simmons, because he all this big sporting good story, well uh, well known in the, in the sporting good industry. So we formed a corporation, you know, with the three of us in it. And if I can back up just a minute, I'll miss one very important point. When he first started making these, he, he tells me one day, he said, I, I need to give my decoy a name. And uh, I said, yeah, you did. And they said, he said, you got any ideas what her name would be? I said, I don't know, Mark. Take whatever you like. And he said, no, hit me with that. You know, I'm not good at that. So I said, well, I can tell you this much. In corporate America today, it's 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 not long and complicated anymore. They, they're away from that. It's short and snappy, easy to remember, rolled off the tongue. You know, it's IBM, it's Apple. You know, it's something like that. So you need something very, you know, very catchy, easy to that come up with. So he said, okay, I get that. What do you think it'd be? Well, I grew up on a farm also, but we, my parents did not farm for a living. We just had a farm. And my dad had a degree in agriculture. He worked in agriculture and he wanted us boys. He grew up on a farm. He wanted us boys to grow up on the farm, but I grew up on mostly a hand labor farm. I was a hand labor. So I was uh, determined to get off that farm, but nevertheless, all right, we had a little machine. And I don't really know what it was. My dad didn't really know what it was, but it had a pair of tractor wheels on it. It had a gasoline engine. It had a clutch and a pair of handles out the back. And my dad said he thought it was a, uh, someone's garden out one time, but we didn't use it for that. He would he would use it to pull empty trailers around, stuff like that. And he would say, get that bojo and bring it over and hook it to the truck. <laughs> and I heard that the whole time I was growing up. And I said, you remember that, Murray? He said, yeah, I do. I said, well, nothing easier to remember, roll off the tongue, you know, never forget, than the word mojo. He said, okay. So I go back to my engineering company, and I have a very gifted uh, uh, PR-type lady there, very gifted in graphics and writing and all that stuff. And she would do proposals for us in the engineering world, which said, said proposals there for these products, you know. And so I told her, I said, look, we need to make Murray some stickers for his decoy. So she made some. And uh, she called it a Mojo Mallard. And she made these stickers. And if you find one of the very first ones, actually the first few years, they got a, they'll have a nylon sticker stuck on the motor on the inside that says Mojo Mallard. And uh, uh, so, so, so we sold them, you know, like that. I'm catching back up to where I what was while ago. So, you know, season's over with. He and I and uh, Jeff Simmons decided we would, we would start business. So, uh, 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 Jeff was going to go to one of the buying group shows and he, he so we were trying to determine how many of these things do we need to make? You know, we have no idea. And Jeff said, well, I'm going to sports Inc., I believe it was, and, uh, be there a week. And when I come back, I'll have a pretty good, I'll talk to everybody. I can't have a pretty good idea. Uh, how many I think I can sell. And so he tells Murray, said, you, you be working while I'm gone and see, determine how many you can make. So we just, he's making these things by hand. And so, okay, do that. So, you know, we'll jump forward a week or two and, uh, Jeff is home. So he, he calls us and we go up and have a meeting with him. Jeff said, I think I can sell 7,500. 
And so, I mean, you think you can make Maurice Murray out a piece of paper in his hand. And he laid it down on the table and it said 75 water. Now that's a throw stroke of luck that they both <laughs> have to deal. But nevertheless, we'll build a business plan on making and selling 7,500 of these things. And uh, 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 so, so jump back to where I left off all ago. The PR later is going to start making us some taglines and, you know, uh, logos and that type of stuff. And she made them all, you know, our original tagline was, it ain't magic if it ain't Ojo, you know. Mm-hmm. So she made that. She made the duck in the soul, and she did all that other stuff. So one day she walked up to my office, and she said, uh, uh, she, they called me Denman around there, not my first name. They said, Denman, you know what Mojo made? I no, well, I ain't got a point. And she said, well, you're the luckiest S-O-B-O-I because it means magic. So why by accident we have named your product a magic mallard. I said, really? <laughs> I'd rather be lucky than you. So <laughs> anyway, so we uh, well, there, it, it it went from there. And uh, that first year, when we set out to make uh, seventy five hundred, uh, we uh, we made and sold a little over fifteen thousand. So wow! Was, what no, year was that? No, that was the year two thousand. Wow! It'd be the two thousand twenty one, the uh, uh, two thousand and oh oh one hunting season. Yeah, it's interesting. I had a couple things. Rob Matthews, big rice farmer in the area, District 10. So I know Rob, a uh, big supporter of CWA. And, and the other partner you mentioned there was actually, my understanding was Greg Cornell, who was uh, at the time a caterer for us, Silver Sage Caters. And uh, I heard about these things back in there. I've been obviously with CWA since about ni- since 99. So I think right at the time all this was going about. And it was a uh, it was. A, it was interesting to hear about these, and as a duck hunter, to to have the same feelings I think you had experienced when you first saw them. You know, you put it out, but you, you think, look no around, way. Yeah, you look around <laughs> your you know you look over your shoulder like I'm gonna look I'm gonna look like an idiot out here with this thing in the water. And in fact, I had <clears throat> hunting wise, I had a first experience just like that. It wasn't with the, with the the duck decoy; it was actually with the blade, which were yeah. I think kind of around that same time. And uh, I actually told my hunting partner, I'm not going to put that out. It's going to you know, it's going to scare them away. So um, what an awesome story. And I mean, it's just obviously the connection to California and, and the fact that you took, you and your partners took this business where it's at today is just an awesome testament to your genius and, and seeing a brand, seeing a product and then innovating. I mean, the, the, we'll get into the new <laughs> products that are now out and, and just how many of these decoys are now being sold. Can you tell us the number now, 15,000 to what? Oh, no, it would be more than that, but we make so many different skews yep. in the duck, you know, in the, in the duck world. You'd have to go back now to ball up, but I think probably in a typical year, we would sell uh, around 100,000 of the wow. duck people wow. was in sales, you know, so uh, people always find it interesting. Our number one selling product is the duck decoy. Oh, no, really? <clears throat> but we don't have 15 different versions of the duck yeah, sure. either, you know? so that would make it. That would make a difference, but you know, I, I remembered something about uh, Robert Matthews when you said that. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that, that that Robert had filed for a patent on the device that he built, but he also had the concept in his patent. So we filed for a patent on the direct drive, but we don't have the concept. So he he filed a year before we did, and he has issued a year before we did, and and so we filed a year later, and it issued a year later. By the time ours issued. Uh, Robert wasn't making his little device it, it, anymore. Uh, he was making, you know, what we had filed for a patent from. So our patent attorney uh, suggested that we get with him and see if we could cross license one another. And then between the two patents, we had everything. And so we meet with him actually at Shot Show and, uh, and, and propose that to him. And uh, I'll never forget what he said. He said, look, guys, I really need to get back to Rice Farm. Yeah. And uh, that's what I do for a living. And he said, I thought I'd just sell y'all this. And I said, okay. So we made a deal with him. We bought his company just to get his back. And uh, uh, and, and so the rumors that floated around about that, you know, I've, I've heard of they'll get pretty far to the right or left or whatever. But it was really, you know, quite simple. He he wanted to get back in, in sure. farming. Apparently, he was spending a good bit of time doing this. And uh, Anybody that ever goes in, in the business of doing something like that, you know, uh, finds out pretty quick it's a lot more work than he thought it was. <laughs> and uh, and so so we bought him, you know, we bought his company and uh, we get his patent and uh, and he went back to rice farming. I guess I, I haven't heard from him in years, but uh, he was a nice guy and he really got it started, uh, you know, started very well. But 
Uh, I did cover the part when I said, you know, it probably started about the not, not mid-90s, you know. They started with that big blade that mm-hmm. you, you referenced mm-hmm. a minute ago, which everybody called the Golden Post. Yep. yep. <laughs> uh, and, and a guy named Matt Bride, I do not remember what his first name is, he got a patent on that, uh, on that big blade, the Gold Post thing. And I've seen some evidence that some guy was ahead of him on it, but the, he didn't get his back up quick enough. Now, I, I've just seen some evidence. I'm not saying that's true. I don't really know. But, uh, he, he certainly, the big boy certainly got the, you know, got the concept going. And I guess the next logical move was to put him in the duck body, you know. So There's, were you guys the first ones to introduce the duck body to the spinning wing? Or did that come when you guys saw it from California? Was it just a wing when you guys saw it from California? No, those guys put it in a, in a decoy okay. body. I've yep. seen pictures of uh, of one of the original ones in California, and of course the guy had the big big uh, big blade, the gold post, and another guy had a decoy with some great big wings on it, where his two wings together was as big as, if not larger than, you know, the big blade. Yeah, and I never seen it work or anything. I just saw some pictures where the where the guy was, you know, was doing an interview or something. That so, so the you know the concept totally came out of uh, out of a valley up in California. Yeah, that's that's amazing to me. I mean, how far you know it's come. And me and Scott were kind of talking before we started this podcast. Is is what do you see for the future? I mean, how how much further can this go? And what is the future of spinning wing decoys or motion decoys in general? It seems like. Almost people are reverting to a sense. I know a lot of people in California are going back to the goalpost instead of um, the traditional decoy with the two spinning wings. And where, where where's the the industry going as far as motion decoys right now? Well, yeah, right now they're they're mostly going into uh, water motion mm-hmm. instead of instead of wings. And uh, uh, it, it, you know, if you can make your decoys look exactly like live ducks, obviously that's the ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. And we're not anywhere close to that. I mean, you you take a video, you guys would have a lot of experience in that, but you know, you look at a video of a set of ducks on on the water, on dry ground, it doesn't matter if they relaxed, if they not alert or whatever, you know. Uh, they typically make it a lot of noise, a lot of motion. I mean, it's like a bunch of hogs in the water so. And so, you know, there's an endless number of things that you could do in order to, to you know, make your decoys look more lifelike. But, you know, you have, you have to inject uh, practicality into it. You know, you can't go out there with three dozen mechanical decoy all mm-hmm. doing, you know, different things. It's just, uh, it's just it's just too much. It's too much work. It's too much maintenance on them. It's too much. So, you know, I don't see that happening. But, you know, there are steps that go in. In, in directions. So uh, a few years ago, we uh, came out with the flop of flicker. Y'all probably yep, familiar yep. with the flop mm-hmm. of flicker. And, uh, uh, as, and I worked on that for years before I could make it look like I wanted to look for it, brought it out. Uh, and then we didn't do a very good job of making it. So we took it off the market and came back a year later to fix all our problems with it. But, uh, 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 you know, ducks, fortunately for all of us, ducks will catch on to most anything you put out there. Unless you could make a set of decoys look exactly like my ducks, they're going to catch on to it. So it wasn't, you know, all that many years after the spinning wing uh, decoy came out that, you know, people was talking about ducks flaring, you know, mm-hmm. off of them. And, and they do. I've seen that. And my belief is that that decoy is just making a lot more flash than a duck could make. And the ducks basically, you know, catch on to it, especially the age ducks, you know, probably an age hen mallard, you know would be the first one to catch catch off to it. And I think that's what they could detect when they got up close. And uh, so a lot of people don't use it then, but, you know, that, and I'm the wrong messenger for this, okay? <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, so they don't want to use one, so they take it out and spray it. And, uh, you know, really it's not affecting me from a businessman because they still bought the decoy. They don't want to put it in a spray it. But, uh, no, the, it, it, you know, to use a to you to properly use a, a spinning wing decoy, you first need to understand, uh, you know what it does and how it's different from motion. Because unfortunately, we all started off calling those things motion decoys, and they're really not a motion decoy. If the wings are turning fast enough to generate the strobe, you barely see any movement. You know, 
So, you know, here at Bojo, when, when I you know, write things up or, or, or do interviews or whatever I do, you know, I first try to get the people to separate their thought process into two different parts. One of them is uh, is the, the spinning wing concept. It, it stands alone by itself. And then motion, you know, just movement of something, movement of something. But back to the, you know, flock of, flock of ducks sitting there, you don't see one great big flash like a spinning wing decoy does. You see a lot of little random flashes that pass through the through the set of uh, ducks. You know, I kind of like to liken them to what we call lightning bugs. Y'all may call them fireflies out there mm-hmm. in some part of the country. But you know, when they're out at night, you just see a flash, 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 and that, that's what I tried to simulate with the uh, with the uh, with the flock of flickers. But the point of all that is that uh, it, as far as where the system can go from here, you know, you can do things. The decoy itself does not actually have to move or whatever. You know, you can do that out in the spread, and the ducks can't can't tell the difference. So that takes you in a lot of different directions, right there, of things that you could make. Uh, and then, as I said before, you know, disturbance of the water surface is the most popular thing going out there now. And uh, we have some new products. I, I think you saw them at the shot show. That you know, to do that with, and I, I've been on quite a few months this year, and I'm going to talk to a lot of people who do that. And uh, on days when you don't have any wind, you know, it could really help you. If you have a lot of wind, then you probably don't need as much of that as you do. Uh, even though it will help even on the wind today because it breaks up the repetitive cycle of the waves that the wind's making. It makes it look like something else is there, sure. you know, making ripples on the water. But, you know, there are there places you can go, certainly, there's enough technology available today to do all kinds of different things. It's just as a practical matter, the duck hunter. I mean, you know, y'all, y- y'all know, duck hunting is rough on equipment. It's really rough on equipment. And, uh, you know, everybody we hunt with, they throw their mojo in the bottom of the boat on the back yeah. of four wheel or whatever <laughs> like that. You know, so the more sophisticated they get, the more maintenance problem you're gonna have in treating equipment like that. So yeah. I, I don't think it's anywhere near the end of it. I think you see on a lot of things that uh, I don't know how practical they really are. And, uh, you know, uh, people that are hunters love, would love to be in the industry. And I get it. I mean, I, I was glad to be in the industry myself. And uh, uh, and so if they come up with a product, you know, they'll develop it and try to put it on the market. And that's good. I mean, that's, that's what the American system is about. But I see they get some kind of what I'd call Maybe I'd call them not very practical products out there. So I, I don't know, but it, it's not it's not at its end yet. There'll be a lot of innovation come forward. Well, I think that's the ingenious part about hunters and duck hunters specifically is everybody has their little gadgets that they they have on, on top of the ones you you know buy from Mojo. And it's I think it's I think it's cool about what we do is that people have different things that they do that are effective. And then obviously, you know, you talk about the motion. I did get to see the new, uh, the Mallard, the new, triple whammy, the triple whammy, the Mallard machine, you reinvent that, that's new for 24, uh, which are fantastic new products. I mean, the, the amount of movement of water that that Mallard machine does is, is phenomenal. Um, and just like you said, I think it's key. You can't just put the spinning wing out. You have to have the motion on top of it just to, like you said, to look, Look more natural in the water. So. Yeah, and the spinning wing decoy, uh, highest and best use is and always has been long range attraction. But because at the very beginning, the ducks want to land right on top of them, the hunters looked at them as a finishing device. Yeah. And that was not their original intention. Their original intention was a, was long range attraction. And that's why I said earlier, you know, the right thing to do is not to, not to not use the spinning wing decoy. If they don't want to land folks to it, put it over there. You don't have to put your decoy spread. I put it on a dark five mil to dry ground, but it'll attract ducks from a long distance off that you will see uh, if you if you did not have it there because a duck makes the thing for miles. A duck won't fly up three, five miles away, you know, see that thing swing by there, and then you'd have to use your duck hunting skills after that to see if you can land it. But uh, it, it, it's a mistake not to run one. Yeah, and I, I as I'll say one time, I'm the wrong messenger. <laughs> <laughs> I I know you had talked about practicality and and your decoys. What happened when you guys decided to do the spoonzilla, and whose whose idea was that to throw a a, a smiling spoony on a, a mojo pole? <laughs> well, it was Randy Russell's. 
getthebooks.com. Uh, okay. And, you know, my co-host of TV, the guy that actually got me into the TV business years and years ago, right after I, we came out in Mojo, Mike Mort. Uh, Mike Mort passed away a few years ago, but he's quite well known in the honey, in the honey uh, industry. And he introduced me to Ramsey Russell. But Mike and Ramsey, you know, were both from Mississippi. And in Mississippi at that time, they shot spoonbills. So well, I'm over here to Mississippi River Valley, Delta, of Louisiana. You know, we call it ourselves trophy hunter. We're going to shoot spoonbills. We shot, we shot uh, mallards. And uh, uh, and the first time him and his partner, Jim Jones, came up with me in that same blind I was telling you about a while ago, I had a, a spring loaded uh, lid on it with a jerk string, you know, so I could jerk the string and lid it fly back, you know. And so, when the ducks would come, we'd get them working around. I would undo that string and hold it lit with my hand. And then I could keep, uh, keep calling doing that. So here come these whole flock of spoonbills. And I never had, gave any thought that they wanted to shoot those spoonbills, you know. So when they finally broke down and all the decoys, I'm trying to hold the lid down. And they tear the lid out of my hand <laughs> and throw it up and just shoot these spoons. I said, what are y'all doing? They said, well, we shoot these ducks. And they make ducks and spoonbills. You know? And uh <laughs> Uh, I, I believe different today, so y'all don't jump on me. I, 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 I've come around. I, uh, Randy says I've come around to the dark side, you know. So uh, uh, I ended up kind of going in the, in the video business with them. And uh, and so it got to be a, you know, a, a running joke between us over here, don't shoot spoonbills, them people where I do shoot spoonbills. And uh, and we got in with Randy a good bit, and, and Mike and Randy was over on the, Red River between uh, North Texas and uh, Oklahoma doing a hunt. And it was late season, and uh, there was something with a guy named J.J. Uh, uh, Kent. He passed away, unfortunately, but uh, he was a great uh, uh, guy out there back in that area. So it was, it was getting tough. You know, last weekend, the season was getting tough. And so he comes and said, look, I got a pond just covered with ducks. All the ducks can get this pond. And, uh, and they said, oh, one is good. It's good. Well, there's one problem. So was that? They all spoon beer. So I don't matter to us. I don't matter to us, you know. He said, "Well, there's another problem. It's a sewer pond. <laughs> oh. We'll hide that in a camera. They won't be able to see that." <laughs> so they go over and shoot limits of spoon bills, you know. And then by the time that gets to me, Ramsey says that I said, "I don't know if it did this or not." That you two cannot go off again without adult supervision. And uh, uh, and so that's kind of what got the big controversy going. So. Fast forward a few years, and Ramsey and I are in Obregon, Sonora, Mexico, uh, hunting those Mexican mallards. Uh, and so, in Mexico, that they fought more formal than we are now in the United States. You know, they got a dad down in the room. They won't start eating until everybody gets seated. You know that. You know. So I see Ramsey walk into this room with his hunting coat over his arm, like a waiter would have, you know, the towel over his arm. And I see my two cameramen stand up, so I know they're up to some kind of no good, you know. So <laughs> Ramsey springs that spoon, the original Spoonzilla, which he didn't call Spoonzilla, he called it Realmzilla after Ramsey. And uh, uh, and it, just like the one we made, except it had a gold tooth mm-hmm. instead of missing tooth. And so they, they get up and they go, embarrass me, play a joke on me, whatever, you know. And then I think Ramsey's original intention was to give me that decoy. I mean, he handed it out to me before I get my hand on He jerked it back, and I, I've never had it since then. You know? <laughs> but we go hunting with it the next two or three days and make little phone videos and put them on, you know, put them on social media, and they, you know, get all these numbers and everything. So everybody says, you know, look, y'all sell one of those. So I said, okay, so, so we both make one, you know. Can't make one with a gold tooth, but we can make one with a missus tooth, you know. So. <laughs> and uh, 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 that does seem to be of interest to people. I said, well, you know. We're going to make fun of somebody. Now, what race of people is okay with you making fun of? Us rednecks. We don't care. Jeff Foxworth, you got real rich making <laughs> fun of us rednecks. You know, so what's, what's a good redneck there? You got a missing tooth, though. That's, <laughs> a, that's how we got to the missing tooth. That is a wild story. Yeah. I mean, they must sell pretty well. I've seen a bunch of them out there. Yeah, they, they did. They sold real well. The, they, the first year, they just went so fast as you could get them out there, they sold. And then they slowed down to be a more you know, uh, reasonable product. But, 
you know, they're good gift idea, I mean, good yeah. Christmas presents. And, you know, people, we get all kind of pictures where people put them on a Christmas tree as Christmas decorations. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's just kind of a fun, <clears throat> fun type thing. And I'm so Yeah. I don't know if you've heard this. I was telling Chuck this, uh, did our, our one of our biggest dinners in the state, uh, Clusa, our Clusa dinner run by Drake and Tiffany Fasaro up there in Duck Duck Country up in Clusa. They do table sponsors and they have the Pintail, the Mallard, and then the Spoonie tables. Well, every single table, depending on what you buy, has a mojo on top of the table spinning. So you walk, I'm gonna have to f- dig up some video and, and pictures and send you, but. You walk into the room and there's 40 mojos in that room spinning on top of the tables. And it's, it is a sight to see uh, uh, and, and pretty awesome. You know, we've got the Spoonzilla represented there and, and obviously the Pintail and the Mallard. But uh, what, a, what, a cool, what a cool product, what a great dinner. And, and uh, you know, there isn't, there isn't a duck hunter probably in the world that doesn't know the name Mojo, which I think just says a lot about what you've done and what your company has been able to do. You know, you are, uh, you know, I'm going to say like the, the Xerox of copying, right? You know, you see a spinning wing decoy and, and I think everybody says, well, that's a mojo, mm-hmm. a mojo decoy. And uh, what a e- testament if, to you guys. Even if they're not mojos, yeah. a lot of people say, oh, I got yeah. my mojo. It's, yep. Yeah, yeah. It's synonymous with spinning wing decoy at this point. Well, thank you. Thank you for those kind words. You, you can go to a, most any kind of uh, outdoor, especially hunting type convention uh, from the SHOT Show to the Safari Club International to National Wild Turkey, somebody there will put one of them up on top of their booth just as an attractor. You know, <laughs> sure. It, it attracts easiest. more than ducks, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. So with your experience with Mojo, you've been able to you know hunt all over the world for different species, big game, waterfowl. What's been your favorite waterfowl hunt or region to go to? Well, you know, I, I get asked that question a lot, uh, Carson, uh, you know, uh, especially relative just hunting in general. So mm-hmm. What do you like to hunt in general in the most? And I, and I don't have an answer to that uh, uh, because I like to hunt everything. Yeah. You know, I just like to be outdoors and hunt everything. But if I was going to go rabbit hunting tomorrow, I'd be just about as excited about that. But, you know, I, I love, uh, I love uh, duck hunting, waterfowl hunting in general, not just duck, duck hunting. Uh, but, you know, I've been fortunate enough to go. African kill elephant, and uh, I've got the North American ran swam a wild sheep, you know, and that was real exciting, uh, you know, to do that. But it, 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 I don't think the species, you know, matters matters that much uh, uh, if you like to hunt, you know. Yeah. And what I about think, what about location that you've been to? It, 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 well, the, the most interesting location I've been to is, believe it or not, uh, Peru. Hmm. Oh. Okay. And uh, 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 and it, and it wasn't necessarily the, the ducks. Uh, uh, Randy Russell and I went down. He had been there, and he said, "Come on, let's go down there." Got the highest concentration of cinnamon teal in the world. And uh, I don't know if that's true or not. That's, that's what he said. And uh, but it's the only duck they've got there, you know. So we go, and uh, uh, it's just the most interesting thing in the world. You you, you land in this uh, uh, pretty big city of Arequipa, about four hours from the coast. And drive across this desert. I, I mean, the desert don't have a blade of grass or a bush or anything. It's just sand. Huh? And you come over this last hill, and there's the Pacific Ocean, and this river that these cinnamon teal and all are coming out of, uh, of, of Central Peru, where the volcanoes are, and it runs into the Pacific Ocean right there, uh, where we were hunting, and it's uh, it, 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 the hunting was fantastic. Teal just flying up and down that that, that little river, and so. Uh, those guys would uh, it, it would would cut uh, and make a map of uh, cane. Cane grew all up and down the side of that river, so you really couldn't get to the water. You had to kind of cut a hole to get to the water. They would leave them together and uh, uh, and put them out there in the water. We would stand on it. So I don't know if you ever tried to shoot ducks oh, wow. down on a waterbed or not, but that's about what it amounts <laughs> to. Especially teal, my you goodness. Got these, <laughs> got these flat little teal. You out there on a waterbed trying to shoot that. It was very interesting, and they and they had uh, they had uh, uh, exposed human skeletons oh. there, uh, up up where the sand was, and uh, they they took us and showed us a bunch of those. We got pictures, video, you know, all that stuff. And uh, uh, these were ancient people. I don't know how far back, but ancient. And uh, but the local people, of Peru, very very poor country, and uh, these local people would dig it up these graves because some of the 
more elite of the ancient people, would, they would bury them with some type of treasures. The, the most desirable one, they said, was a feather shroud, which would bring about 50,000 U.S. today, and they're making $400 a year. So they're digging up those graves uh, just to get the treasures out of them. So there's all, all kinds of different things like that uh, you saw. Wasn't the best duck I've ever been on by any means, but uh, it was probably the most interesting trip of them. Have you have you been out to California to hunt ducks yet? You know, I'm embarrassed to say I have never hunted ducks. In the oh, state of I'm gonna get you and Ramsey out here. I know Ramsey was out uh, several years ago, and oh, he's, he's um, been there every year for the last yeah, few years. Yeah, yeah. And, Rem, and we talked about me going with him, but I could never arrange it. I could never get the schedule. Well, when but it I worked, know it's a storied waterfowl place. I mean, I don't think oh, yeah. anybody in waterfowl. Don't know that. Yeah, a lot of people don't don't understand it how how good we have it and the wonderful waterfall hunting we do have. So when you and Ramsey get out here, make sure you look us up. I know we'll get you out yeah. and get you guys on maybe on one of our properties or out out shooting some Pacific Flyway ducks and geese. Okay, well we should just set that up and do it. My buddy Chad Bell, did he on out there every yep. year also? You know, yep. He's he's invited me, but I. My schedule never worked out on that either, but I, I would love to do it. It's something I, I think about. I see it in all the magazines. I see it on TV and in videos, so it would certainly be a, a desirable thing to do. Absolutely. We'll make it yeah. happen. Well, yeah. And we'll get, get Ramsey on this podcast as well. well. Yeah, that's one of the ones we haven't had yet. So. I'm sure he's got some stories as well. Oh, he, he's, a, he's an excellent storyteller. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is, is there any new uh, Mojo products coming down the pipeline that weren't shown at SHOT Show that you can give us a hint of, or is, are all the new ones out now that were uh, uh, No, we, we have about, I think, 21 or 22 new products uh, on well, the boards. Wow. That we're, okay. we're, that we're working on. They're not all waterfowl products, but the, most of them are. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had one product there at SHOT Show that wasn't a, wasn't a waterfowl pro, uh, product per se. That's a our new model of a pick stick and yep. um, but it's an excellent tool for a uh, waterfowl and then and it has a unintended consequence that people will likely pick up their empty hulls if they can do it conveniently like that so great product well, we got we yeah. got some they in various stages of uh, uh of development uh i can't really tell you what they are but they they mostly uh oh it's just us nobody's listening <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, uh, Oh, uh, well, I know better than that. <laughs> I see the numbers. You got to get on some of these things. It's incredible. I mean, to get the numbers like that. But it's, uh, we got some cool water motion uh, uh, products, even though it'd be pretty hard to one up that Mallard machine. It's, it, uh, I'm very, very proud of them, of the Mallard machine. But we got some uh, uh, combination type spinning wing decoys, you know, things like that. And I'm just sitting here trying to think of that list. I don't really know or remember all those things. So how does that? How does that happen? How do you do? You sit around the boardroom or sit in the, in the duck blind and just just try to think of what you haven't thought of yet. And and how does the concept really start? Uh, you know, Skip Knowles, a editor of yeah. Wildfowl Magazine, and yep. Skip's a good friend of mine. So he asked me one time, I said, where you come up with all them ideas? And I said, well, Skip, i tell you the truth. They come to me in the night. <laughs> but yeah, all my adult life, I'd only sleep about an hour or two at a time that I'd wake up. And then I'd go back to sleep. I'd wake, when I'd wake up, and, you know, you got these thoughts. I, I think it happened to everybody, you know. And so uh, in the engineering business, I used to send them, send them to my employees, you know, and then, Got to be such a joke, I guess you call it a joke. You know, I said, you get that email with them at three o'clock this morning? So I quit doing it and I sent them to myself now and then I sit forward them on about seven o'clock. <laughs> but they just kind of come to you and uh, some of the very best ones were right in front of your face at all times. And it took forever, ever to see them. So hmm. I don't know, you know, exactly why that is, but it's just, it, it, you know, I, I'm sure about engineering education background has an influence upon it but my engineer wasn't in this in, this, in these fields i was in the uh, civil engineering but you know it, it, it gives you the thought process you know or and it's basically get hunt a void you know can you identify a void uh in what products are available now and if you can identify a void you know can you can you feel that void it's a thought process somewhat like that or you know you're out hunting sometime and you say man if i had something to do this yeah you know it would really help so you go back and see if you can make one you know we made a lot of accessories over the you know over the first few years they were excellent products 
but they wouldn't sell because in the beginning, all you needed was that Bojo Fenway decoy in, you need accessories. And so we got a stack full of them back in the warehouse that's left over from those days where we, where we developed it. We never sold it. Yeah. How many, thi- how many things have you created that haven't come to light or just totally didn't work out that you thought? Well, I, you know, I, I would guess uh, 20, 30, 40. Yeah. I don't know. A lot of them. And so the, you could sell them today if you went back to get them because yeah. now they're kind of into accessories and, yep. you know, uh, things like that. But uh, we wouldn't, you know, we could have, uh, me, and, me and Murray Crow one time made a, made a decoy. Uh, well, we, we didn't make a decoy. We took a Mojo Mallard and uh, we mounted it on a pole uh, with a, a lifter spring, a bow lifter, a motor bow lifter spring. And, and pop riveted a, a, a plate to the bottom of it, and that thing would shake, and the, and the paddle would be down in the water, you know, it's just making ripples all around it, which you didn't need it back then. You know, oh, today, wow. today you need it, that'd be, a, that'd be a great product. If you go back and look at those first few years of Mojo Bauer, they got three holes in the wing where you can set that wing offset, and so it, it vibrates a lot when it turns, and that was... Uh, from products that we were making to, you know, make ripples on the water in addition to the spinning way. Hmm. That's neat. Development of products right there. Yeah. You know, I mean, just to hear oh, that. Yeah, next, you... next fall, you'll see three companies have that. Product. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, just what a testament to you. I mean, just being an inventor to hear, to hear you had those many ideas that went through your mind and that, that, that don't work. I think that's just a testament to business and, and, and you know, and being that type of person that just throws it out there and tries it. I mean, good good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you got to give a better thought than I did uh, about what the market's ready for right now. And, yeah. you know, some of that stuff, the market just wasn't ready for. But it's a pretty thick old market, as you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not whether or not you have a great idea or not. It's whether or not that great idea's time is now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that very true. I think, too, I equate it somewhat to a little bit to fishing where sometimes stuff is – Sometimes stuff is made more for the fisherman than the fish, right? Sometimes, oh, yeah. sometimes you have to sell the duck hunter, not the ducks, right? You got to. Yeah, it's like how many just the general yeah. floating duck yeah. decoys look just like the other ones, yeah. and it's like yeah. you know, they're just coming out with the next thing, unless yeah. it actually has an actual function to it, like water movement or yeah. motion. You know, there's it's just yeah. the next greatest and latest sure. thing. Sure. Sure. Well, you see how the detail has improved on a lot of those decoys. And, oh, yeah. You know, technology and materials and, you know, all that stuff allows you to do it. Uh, detail and, and the detail on a lot of them are more than the bird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's because you try and sell it to the duck owner, not the bird. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. yeah. But yeah. Uh, we, we, we pass what a real bird looks like and some of that stuff. Sure. No, definitely. Well, Terry, we appreciate you coming on our podcast. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? Any any parting words of wisdom? Well, I don't know if I have any words of wisdom or not, <laughs> but uh, I, I know I, I appreciate what you guys do for for waterfowl hunting. You, y'all probably want the better, if not the best, I would say the best of the uh, more localized organizations that they are. Y'all probably done more for for ducks in general. Even though I know you're focused on the California ducks, but then whatever you develop, you know, but uh, will pass across the whole, uh, all the way around the world. So, you know, you all deserve a whole lot of credit for what you did. And, uh, uh, and, and I appreciate it. And I know duck hunters in general appreciate it. And so if we can ever help y'all in any way, you uh, let us know and we'll do that. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming on this podcast. We really do. Yeah, thanks for you guys have been really generous to our organization. We ask, uh, you know, call it for a donation. You guys are happy to do that, and and just nice to have you know brands like Mojo behind this organization, and and appreciate you guys. And we'll uh, we'll make sure Chad Belding, Ramsey Russell, and uh, Terry, you guys out here in Hunt, yeah, California. Let's get let's get maybe out we here. just maybe we call the all on one hunt. How? Uh, that'll work. We that, can make it happen. I, I just want to be on the fly on the wall for that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like fun. Maybe we do a podcast while we're out there. Heck there yeah. you go. There we go. That'd be great. All right, Terry. We appreciate it. Have a good rest of your day. Yes, Thanks, sir. Terry. Enjoy it being here. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Save It for the Blind podcast. You can find our podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.